Hello, my name is Joe Barnard. I have an interesting video today. You know what, that is already a lie. Look deep into my eyes and know this. This is a boring video. Unless you're a controls engineer, it's just not gonna be that interesting. But it's the real stuff that happens here. So let's get into it. Basically, what we're doing is we are characterizing the performance with a high-speed camera. Um, we're characterizing the performance of the thrust vector control mounts that uh, stabilize the rockets I build. This is just a regular old TVC mount. It actually, just based on the soot here, I'm pretty sure this has flown on something. Um, but we're looking at the servo response time with a high-speed camera at about 1,000 frames per second so that we can update the model in Simulink, the, the dynamic model of the vehicle, and this is going to let us tune our PID values better. It's going to really help uh, keep the rockets more stable in the long term. So it's a little bit of a boring video. I hope you enjoy, and if you don't, I don't know, unsubscribe. That's how YouTube works. All right, hope you enjoy. Here we go. So what's going on here is model verification. We have a model or a simulation of how the rocket works. I've got my actuator here, all right? This is the thrust vector control mount, the TVC mount for the rocket. Um, I have some understanding of how these servos respond to a command, i.e., uh, what is the time between when the computer, when signal, this little computer right here, when signal sends the command to tell the vectoring mount, you know, push five degrees to the side. When Signal does that, we need a good model in our simulation of how long does that take, what does that transition from zero degrees to five degrees look like. So the way this works is I've got a high-speed camera here. It's the Sony RX100 Mark IV. Um, it's an excellent camera. It's a little expensive for a point and shoot, but it can do up to 1,000 frames per second. We'll be filming at 1,000 FPS here um, to get a really good sense of how long this takes um, in super, super slow motion. Now, the other way you could do this too is by sticking an IMU, an inertial measurement unit, on the top or any part of the thrust vector control motor mount, and that would give you the actual data. So long as you were recording from the same exact data uh, recording device, which would be a computer in this case, if you hook the IMU up to uh, this thrust vector control mount, you could get uh, real-time data on the exact angle as you command it to that angle. But um, I have enough data on that already, so I'm just gonna be using this camera, which has literally just shut down because it ran out of battery. It's a great camera, but the battery life is awful. Uh, also, I have headphones on because I'm listening to music because this type of testing is a little bit boring. Okay, we're looking pretty good here. I have a tiny little program that's running on the signal computer, which when I turn it on, it waits for a little bit and then it actuates the mount to five degrees. Like that, and it turns on a little green light once it does it too. So on the high speed camera, we'll see that green light turn on, which indicates exactly when we've started our signal, exactly when we sent that, and uh, then we can get a good characterization of just what our performance looks like on these actuators. All right, so I've got plenty of light now. I've moved them a little bit closer, and I would say it's time to start running some tests. So we're in the shooting setting. I'm gonna turn on the computer, give it a second, and then start recording. Rolling. And there we go. Excellent. <laughs> it's pretty easy. Probably started a little bit too soon. It looks like we've got some flicker in that shot, but that's okay. We're not going for, uh, we're not really going for art here. We're just going for science and data. Here we go. So the green light just turned on and you can see the servo turn over to actuate that uh, thrust vector control mount to five degrees. There we go, green light is off and we're swinging that servo mount back. You can see there's considerable delay. Um, some of it seems to be signal delay in terms of the computer just not refreshing that, that servo update rate fast enough. Enough is probably the wrong word. There's no, <laughs> there's no wrong answers here, but I'm serious, there's not. The, the point of these tests are not to succeed or fail the point of these tests are to get a really solid idea of what our actuators you know how they perform you can build a rocket that works with really slow actuators that's that's absolutely possible the uh the lunar ascent module had some unbelievably slow uh slew rate on the tbc actuators for for the lunar ascent module hi i was wrong about this uh it looks like the actual info is that it was the descent module and the slew rate was 0.2 degrees per second and the ascent stage was only controlled by reaction control jets okay Good job, me. Back to the video. You can certainly build a rocket that has slow actuators. Really what we want is that test data that tells us exactly how 
um, these actuators perform so that when we build it in the model and we start running a bunch of simulations, we have a lot of confidence in our model being really representative of real life. I'm gonna set up the camera a couple more times. I'd like to run two or three more of these tests just to get a, uh, a really good and well-rounded idea of what this performance looks like. Maybe we have a couple of tests that are a little bit fast, a couple of tests that are a little bit slow, and we just wanna get that, uh, you know, we wanna sort of see the bell curve there. Okay, here we go again, running another test. Rolling. Excellent. So watching the footage back again here, you can see we've got that green light and a pretty immediate start to the turn over to five degrees. Um, and then we'll watch for when that green light goes off and see if we see another delay. Um, what we might be doing is just catching that servo update cycle, which is about 50, 50 hertz or so. Uh, we might just be catching it at odd intervals. Um, but it does look like the uh, return to zero degrees is a little bit slower than the actuation to five. So that will be something to look into. All right, one more test on this axis. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the computer and then we'll roll the camera. Give it a sec, rolling. This has gotta be about the most exciting video you could possibly watch, right? Like, you don't have anything better to do than to watch this dude on YouTube actuate a servo plus or minus five degrees. Not even minus, just plus. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at this footage. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the computer. I just put my little mic on and let's open up Adobe Premiere. Oh wait, look at me, I've got it. Also shout out to Apollo 7, pretty dope pick, okay. So we've got our six tests in here and we figure we should probably just put these into a sequence and take a look at what we got. Okay, we've got our sequences set up here. I've also marked the in and out points on each clip, which means that if we go to the marker point, I've actually marked on the clip where the light turns on and where it turns off. And that's gonna help us get some timing data out of this. In the sequence settings here, you'll see that we are at 29.97 frames per second. Uh, we're gonna round that up to 30 because it just is not gonna make a noticeable difference here. So let's just give this a shot. I'm gonna move my playhead over to this first marker. I'm gonna cut this clip, bring it back to the beginning of the sequence, and then we're gonna watch um, and see how long it takes for us to get to a full five degrees. And as, as I scrub back and forth, I'm just gonna guess that it's somewhere around here that we hit about five degrees. So then when I cut the clip and I use this tool right here, you'll see I have a duration of uh, three seconds and seven frames. Um, and so that is gonna equal a total of 97 frames because we have 30 plus 30 plus 30, uh, 30, 60, 90, and then seven extra frames. So 97 frames at 37 frames per second, and this was filmed at 960 frames per second. Okay, right, so we've got 97 frames, and we're gonna divide that by 960, and that is gonna give us 0 0.10104166666. The point is that uh, we're basically taking the number of frames and dividing it into the uh, frames per second, that frame rate, and that gives us the time measurement. So it takes a tenth of a second from when we command five degrees over on the TVC mount um, to when we reach it. Now, hold up, look deep into my eyes and know this, we're not done yet. Because here's the deal, we're not always going to be going directly to five degrees every single time. If we wanted to just represent this with a pure delay block in a, in a simulation, really what I'm looking for is like, what is the time between the command sent and the uh, mount arriving at a nominal deviation? And if we look at any flight data, you know what I can do is I can just pull some up right here. Okay, so here is some flight data from a flight we did of the Scout rocket, I'll link it down below. This this was uh, almost around this time last year, uh, March 18th, 2019. So I will go ahead and just leave this TBC motion on. Uh, this was a pretty normal flight in terms of TBC deflection. And if you'll see, um, we're not even hitting, you know, we're hitting kind of close to five, deg five degrees when we get those transients at liftoff. Um, but the nominal deviations in this thrust vector control mount are pretty small. Uh, it looks like the nominal deviations aren't honestly more than like one or two degrees. And if you wanna give a, a full range, you know, we might be going from one degree to negative one degree at most. But for a nominal flight, we're looking at maybe one or two degrees of nominal thrust vector control. So we can go back into our video editor here and take a look at this clip. And instead of going all the way to five degrees and measuring that whole transition, we can look at how long it takes for the mount to get from zero degrees uh, over to maybe let's say like two degrees or something. We could take a little bit of a guess here. I mean, I can sort of guess at like the fraction of 0.1 seconds that this whole clip represents. 
you know, if I go here, this is probably about one or two degrees right around here, and it looks like we're about a third. So I could say, you know, it takes roughly 30 milliseconds um, for the mount to go from zero degrees to three. Uh, but a better way to do it is perhaps to scale it down. And the way I'm gonna do that is actually by speeding it up um, and seeing if I can get the whole clip to uh, exist in essentially just one second. So I've got this clip existing in one second of time by speeding it up a little bit. Once again, our, our light turns green right at the start um, and we move over to five degrees. But at this point, we're doing this in 30 frames or one second of time. So um, I'm gonna take a look at this. I'm just gonna guess this is probably about one or you know maybe two degrees here. Um, somewhere around here, we're at 12 frames into the, uh, into the clip here. So if we go back into our calculator, 12 divided by 30, um, and we're gonna get 0.4. Now that's not 0.4 seconds, it's actually 0.4 out of the 0.1 seconds, which means this is a 40 millisecond transition from the start of the clip to uh, where the cursor is right now. That's 40 milliseconds of time that is taking to go from zero to one degree or two degrees. So this isn't too bad. 40 milliseconds is somewhat acceptable. It means we could probably vector the thrust at just a little over 20 hertz or 20 times per second with these servos. Now, there's some stuff to keep in mind here. Once again, this is not a pass or fail test. Whatever these servos are giving us, um, I already know from experience that these work just fine. Now, that's not to say that these are the best servos or this is the best setup. There are actually uh, way faster approaches. Um, the Relay Rocket and the old, old Echo Rockets that I used to build had a much faster response time. They had much higher quality servos, but I opted to go with the cheaper sort of 9G brand of servos or 9G form factor of servos that are, you know, they're less accurate, they're less good, they're just all around worse, but they're cheaper. Um, and so, you know, even if you wanted to build a much nicer mount, it doesn't really matter too much. It'll fly no matter what, so long as you model it correctly. Just to drive this home a little bit more, I'm gonna open up MATLAB and we'll give a quick example of how this works. Okay, so in MATLAB, we've got this sub program called Simulink. I'm gonna open that up. We'll start with a blank model um, and just go from there. So this is gonna be an unbelievably simplified version of what you could do to represent the dynamics of your, your rocket model. We'll start with a really basic model here. I'll use a subsystem to represent the rocket dynamics, rocket dynamics. Um, and basically the input here would be the actual thrust vector control force on the vehicle. Um, that would be in Newton meters, so that's a, that's a torque rather than a force, sorry. And the output would be the angle of the vehicle. Um, so we'll just have this little rocket dynamics block. Um, coming out of the output is again the angle. That would likely be measured with a gyroscope or uh, orientation sensor. We're not gonna model those here just to keep it really simple. The next thing I would do is add some type of PID controller. So we'll just say, uh, PID controller, and this is gonna take the input of the orientation of the vehicle. You'll see I've connected them here. It's gonna take that input orientation, and it's going to translate it into some type of force command that we would, or, or, or torque command, or however you wanna structure it. Um, you would take that PID output and feed it back into your thrust vector control system. And then finally on the left side over here, what you would do is you would model that delay, or you would model that transfer function that represents the thrust vector control system. So. Uh, that could be uh, just a delay block to keep it really, really simple. So I have a discrete delay block here and we'll set the sample time to 0.01, which represents uh, basically 10 milliseconds for every step. And we'll say we want four of those to represent the 40 millisecond delay, roughly speaking, uh, for what the thrust vector control mount does. So that's our little delay block. And then here we go. This is what's called, what the cool kids call, feedback control. Why did it go up? There we go, feedback control. So this is, on, look, look deep into my eyes, into my eyeballs right now, okay? This is, this is more simple than you'll ever see anything that, that actually works. But the, the point is that I was trying to use this video to show how you could obtain the uh, dynamics either for the delay or whatever you wanna put here in your system when you model it. Um, and so obviously it doesn't have to be delay too. You could, you could go into the transfer function block here uh, and then you get that, that nice little one over S. So that's gonna bring you into the frequency domain um, and then you can sort of write out your transfer function there. Now about, there are about a thousand ways that you can go about doing this, but the point is uh, I just wanted to show that this, is, this video is dealing with this part of the system. Um, I would like to do videos on uh, dealing with the dynamics part of the system and then dealing with the control law. We can get there eventually, but 
Uh, this is a really simple step and a really friendly way to get into uh, model-based design like this. Anyway, that's all for now. I figured it would be cool to take a look into doing this in, a, in an extremely simple way. Got a bunch of stuff coming up soon, but until then, may your skies be blue and your winds be low. <laughs>